Tonight, on The Good, The Bad, and The Unknown, Jerry Lewis becomes king, can't find a job, and makes a clown cry. Roll the intro. Hello, boys and girls. This is your old friend, RJC, and I am back with another episode of The Good, The Bad, and The Unknown, where I take an artist and I find one work of theirs that I think is very good, one that I think is very bad, and one that uh, maybe not a lot of people know about or are talking about. And this episode is a big one for me personally and professionally because we're talking about the wonderful Jerry Lewis. I am obsessed with Jerry Lewis, not just his work, uh, but the man, very polarizing figure, obviously had tremendous success, also had tremendous failures. He was a hard hitter. He would swing for the fences. So his big hits were huge hits, and uh, his misses were, well, we'll see. Uh, I don't know what to say other than, you know, he became a one-man show at some point. He seemed to be so successful, first, obviously, with Dean Martin, and then that, you know, that was huge on the stage and the screen and television, which was unheard of at the time. And then he, he ended up, uh, obviously, breaking out on his own making films and, and writing and starring and directing them and, and playing multiple roles in them. In that sense, he was a precursor to maybe an Eddie Murphy. Uh, ended up having his own, you know, studio on the lots, which is, you know, unheard of. A Jerry Lewis film is in every way a Jerry Lewis film. He writes them and, and, and he directs them and he's very particular. You can tell when you look at stuff that he, he makes his choices very carefully. The music, the casting... The, the colors, and uh, so when they're good, he has a lot to take credit for, and when they're bad, they're usually all his fault. Uh, so nevertheless, let us prepare and break it down and start with the good of Jerry Lewis, and this is a good that I feel not enough people are talking about. You always talk about, you know, the Nutty Professor or the Bellboy or the Patsy or the Martin and Lewis films and the ha ha even then Lady... Uh, but the later period, Jerry Lewis has has a very successful work that he was amazing in, and that is 1982's The King of Comedy. Now, if you're not familiar with this film, you you need to be. I cannot encourage it enough. It's not a typical Jerry Lewis film. It's not written or directed by him, and, and that's kind of why uh, it works. It is a Martin Scorsese film, and I would say easily it's Martin Scorsese's most underrated work. Uh, I think it's a, a phenomenal film. It's one of those films that gets more relevant as time goes on. If you've seen The Joker and then you watch this film, you will realize that The Joker movie, the recent one, took a lot from this. That is how relevant it is uh, today. However, it's something you can definitely still go back and watch. Uh, it, it, hits, it hits in a different way. It's not an incredibly pleasant film. It is a black comedy. It is very satirical but not in a ha-ha way. Uh, it's not the most pleasant watch, but it still makes an amazing movie. Just listen to the cast. Uh, so, directed by uh, Martin Scorsese. Robert De Niro uh, plays a wannabe comedian named Rupert Pupkin, and he's bordering on wanting to break into the business and kind of being a barnacle and kind of, of stalking uh, Jerry Langford, a famed talk show host and comedian, who uh, is played by Jerry Lewis. He's kind of an amalgamation of Johnny Carson and Ed Sullivan and and obviously Jerry Lewis. Um, Rupert Pupkin is also friends with a woman named Masha, who is played by Sandra Bernhardt in her first film role, and she is young and crazy, and she also knocks it out of the park. Uh, so those two together end up stalking and essentially invading the life uh, of Jerry Langford in a lot of different ways. Uh, I also want to talk about who else is in the cast. Uh, Freddy D. Cordova, who was, was the booker of The Tonight Show. He plays the producer and booker of The Jerry Langford Show. So there's a lot of stuff that's really blurring the lines of, of reality here in a, in a very good way. Tony Randall is in it as himself. Victor Borger is in it as himself. Joyce Brothers is in it as herself. And, of course, true to all the Scorsese films, uh, his mother's in it. Martin Scorsese's mother, Catherine Scorsese, plays, uh, voices uh, Rupert's mom. Especially 
in the age of having to produce stuff yourself and having to be in a basement with a computer and recording stuff and putting it into the world and hope it works, it's an obscenely relevant movie. Another thing I want to point out, if you are uh, a fan of Goodfellas, you will know uh, there's a character in it called Maury. He owns the wig store. Maury's wigs don't come off. Uh, that's a guy by the name of Chuck Lowe. And he was actually Robert De Niro's landlord, I believe, at the time. And that's how he ended up getting into these films. He also has a blink and you'll miss it role. Uh, it's, it's, it's really a background role uh, that you've probably, if you've watched The King of Comedy, you, you've probably missed it. He's in it. He's sitting in um, the back of a restaurant, literally behind the scene. But once you end up seeing him, you can't look away and you'll realize it's him. So if you have watched this movie already, please go watch it again just for the Chuck Lowe uh, appearance. So this is the deal with this. Uh, after Raging Bull was completed, Scorsese thought about retiring from feature films to make documentaries because he felt, quote, unsatisfied and hadn't found his inner peace yet. And if you compare The King of Comedy to Raging Bull, you can see that. Raging Bull is, is really cinematic and, and takes that story for a walk, creatively speaking. Uh, this movie, not so much. It, it feels a lot more grounded in reality and it feels very much like it, it could happen. Uh, however, Scorsese was keen to do a pet project of his, The Last Temptation of Christ. He wanted De Niro to play Jesus. De Niro said, of course, no. And then um, De Niro passed along this script to him. Um, Michael Camino, Camino, whatever, was first proposed as a director, but he withdrew from the project. And then also Bob Fosse was briefly considered to direct this movie, and he suggested Andy Kaufman as Rupert Pupkin and Sammy Davis Jr. in the Jerry Lewis role. And obviously that would be a different film, but I could absolutely see it working. Uh, Robert De Niro does play an Andy Kaufman-esque character in the sense where you, you don't know where the line is between funny and tragic, and he's very meek and very mild. I also think it's one of the the better De Niro performances in the sense that he's completely stripped of, of the tough guy role, and uh, it's nice and refreshing to see. Uh, so anyway, uh, Martin Scorsese uh, ends up being convinced to do it, uh, Scorsese had high praise for Jerry Lewis, stating that during the first conversation before shooting, Lewis was extremely professional and assured him before shooting that there would be no ego clashes or difficulties, which is probably bullshit. But I think Scorsese was smart enough to know that he was dealing with Jerry Lewis. And uh, Scorsese said he felt Lewis's performance in the film was vastly underrated and deserved more acclaim. I think it does. I think it's a great performance you rarely see jerry lewis rein it in anytime there's a camera in front of him he's always hi hey, and putting like a broken cigarette in his mouth or having these glasses on um it's a good performance and you're like wow if you kept going this route you could have done you know a lot more but obviously he was compelled to do uh, what he knew de niro also spent months watching stand-up comedians uh to get the rhythm and timing of their performances and fully in phase in his character, and this is so De Niro, uh, he declined to have dinner with Jerry Lewis for the film, before the film, uh, because he was sp supposed to be at his throat and ready to kill him for his chance. So he didn't want uh, the friendship and the bonding to ruin their on-screen uh, story. Uh, according to an interview with Lewis in the 1983 edition, uh, February 1983 edition of People magazine, he claimed that Scorsese and De Niro employed method acting tricks, including making a slew of anti-Semitic epithets during the filming in order to pump up Lewis's anger. Uh, and if you are familiar with the uh, argument they have when Rupert Pupkin breaks into Jerry Langford's home, uh, I think you could see how that would have worked. You can, see, you can still feel like a lot of the uh, dialogue is definitely improvised in the sense that it's not tightly, tightly rehearsed and it works in that favor. Uh, Lewis said he was invited to collaborate on certain aspects of the script dealing with celebrity life. Uh, originally, the character's name wasn't even Jerry Langford, but Jerry suggested, listen, like, I'm known if you want me to be a celebrity, like, let me be a little bit of me. So they decided to change the name to Jerry. So when Jerry's walking down the street in the movie in New York, people are recognizing him for real and yelling out, hey, Jerry, 
And that, of course, is smartly used in the film. Uh, Jerry suggested an ending where Rupert Pupkin kills Jerry, but it was turned down. Uh, as a result, Lewis thought that the film, while good, did not have a finish. Incredibly, beautifully pompous Jerry Lewis thing to say. Uh, in an interview for the DVD, uh, Jerry Lewis, uh, Scorsese stated that Jerry Lewis suggested that the brief scene where Jerry Lewis is cost, accosted by an old lady for autographs, uh, that was actually a, a real incident that happened to Jerry Lewis, and Scorsese let Jerry Lewis direct that scene. Um, because it did happen to him, and, and Jerry is a famed director, and he certainly knows what he's doing on that front. It was also, I think, very smart uh, for Scorsese as a way to perhaps rein in Jerry Lewis, giving him a little control so he can get him to where he wants to go. Another interesting fact is that the Jerry Langford role was originally offered to Johnny Carson, who was still hosting The Tonight Show at the time, because this is, you know, what year is this? Tonight Show didn't end until the, you know, the early 90s, and here we are in 1982, so he's still still riding the wave of Tonight Show. Tonight Show is still number one at the time, and um, Johnny turned it down because he only wanted to be on TV, and, and, you know, he was very much married to his talk show and, and didn't want to take any chances with the perception of that, and that's fine, but you could only imagine uh, what would happen for him to be in a movie like this and then uh, still be on his talk show. It would have been very, very interesting. The movie is critically acclaimed. Critics love the... <laughs> acclaimed. A little Jerry Lewis. Critics love the movie. Box office bomb. Uh, I, I don't know... I, I think it was because it's an uncomfortable movie. It's a hard sell in the sense that it's Jerry Lewis not being funny, so that's not what they know from Jerry Lewis. Having said that... It's a dark movie, it's unsettling, it's disturbing, but there are also some incredibly funny moments uh, in the movie, but they make you work for them, uh, which is the genius of this film, and to me it makes the, the funny moments even funnier. Even better, and it certainly translates to the film, is that Jerry uh, and Sandra Bernhardt did not get along. Uh, Jerry allegedly was perhaps not the biggest fan of women in the business, which is uh, it's just a terrible thing. However, that tension is really used to Sandra Bernhardt's uh, advantage. Uh, she was young. She was hungry. Uh, she certainly was not going to take any shit from Jerry. Jerry did not seem to be a fan of her. Apparently, he was very mean to her on set. And um, he was so mean that they made him write an apology note to her. I'm sorry, blah, 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 blah. And he gave it to her. And uh, the next day, apparently, he took the note back from her dressing room, which is so very Jerry. Uh, so, uh, this is from a Sandra Bernhard interview with, uh, Arts Beat. She said, uh, when they keep cutting to him and he looks like he's suffering, I don't think he was acting. Marty would let him direct, direct a little bit in the movie and in the scene, once I've cut Jerry out of his tape where he hits me and knocked me out, he wanted me, in my brawn panties and high heels, to spin into a large glass table lit with a hundred candles. He kept showing me how I could do it, and I kept saying, I can't do it, Jerry. And he would say, you can do it, you can do it, I've done it a hundred times. Finally, Marty interceded, and he just puts me up against the wall, knocks me out, and I slide down and fall into a pad. That was a crazy, classic Jerry Lewis moment. It's a phenomenal film in almost every way, and even especially in light of The Joker, which, which derives so much from this film, it needs to be watched and appreciated for the masterpiece it is. Uh, so that's some good. That's some very solid Jerry good, uh, which I'm happy about uh, because now we're going to get into the bad. And the bad is a 1980 film, so two years before this, and it's called Hardly Working. Uh, this is considered Jerry's comeback film. We're going to be working backwards a little bit because he got worse before he got better. So the comeback film, before this, he made a movie called Which Way to the Front, which was like a World War II comedy, which involved a guy who kind of looks like Hitler and, uh, you know, a big mix-up, kind of the uh, the Prince and the Popper kind of deal. Uh, it wasn't that good. It wasn't that good. It wasn't a good move. And then he made a movie, uh, which we will talk about in our unknown section, because even though Hardly Working is bad, the unknown may be even worse. So this is a little backwards, but we'll piece it together. So he made two, generally speaking, really bad films in a row. One was Which Way to the Front, and then the second one, which we'll talk about, was, was an unmitigated disaster. So this was him getting back to normal. He's like, you know what? I'm known for certain things. 
let's hit hard with the classic Jerry. Uh, but at this point, he's a lot older in a sense where his age should have dictated a little bit of an evolution, and, and that's not happening here at all. The film is hardly working, and here is the premise. A Bo Hooper, Jerry Lewis, a clown, so we're in trouble already, finds himself unemployed when the circus where he works suddenly closes. He winds up living with his sister against the wishes of her husband. From there, he goes job to job, wreaking havoc along the way. He finally finds some stability as a postal worker until he finds out that his boss is his girlfriend's father. The father hates all mail carriers because his daughter's ex-husband was one, so he tries to wreck Bo's life, but Bo overcomes the odds and succeeds not only at work, but at impressing the father. Uh, so this great idea, similar in a sense to Steve Martin's The Jerk, and is this bumbling fool who seems to just wander through life. The main difference is Steve Martin, I think, was young and lovable. Uh, Jerry is, is old and bitter, yet trying to be uh, young and lovable. And it's just, what, what is this 50-year-old man doing dating this young woman and trying to impress her father? Like, you're a man. You're an adult man. Just, like, get over it. Um, the film opens. This tells you what a hard-on-the-nose comeback film it is. The film opens with a montage of scenes from earlier Jerry Lewis films, including the bellboy, Cinderella, the errand boy, who's minding the store, and the patsy. They're, they're literally, you know, just saying to him, hey, like, do you remember me? We can do this. Of course, Jerry owned all his films so he could do stuff like that, but it's not promising for a film that it opens with footage of other better films to convince you how good it is. There are also connections in this movie to other Jerry Lewis films as the clown makeup worn by Lewis in this film was designed by him from 1954's Three Ring Circus and later reused in 1965's The Family Jewels. You've, you may have seen uh, a lot of famous pictures of Jerry Lewis with clown makeup on, and it's always the similar look. So not only is he reusing footage from films, he's reusing clown makeup from two uh, of his previous films. This is tell you how, uh, how good it's going to get. The work on the film was suspended for about six months in 1980 after the production ran out of money. So, uh, you know, this movie, the premise is just Jerry going from job to job. And it's basically cut scenes of, of physical comedy of him trying to do jobs and failing. And yet, somehow, this one-man show still ran out of money. Uh, Lewis himself declared personal bankruptcy. Because of this, there are many notable continuity issues throughout the film. So who knows who filmed what, when they have to go back to certain scenes. You'll see hair changes, looks change, tans change. Uh, so technically speaking, which is something he's not, you know, known to bungle, is a mess. Looking back on the shoot, which took place in Florida, Lewis admitted that the whole experience was uh, a mixed bag. I have to admit that the awful strain of the past 10 years showed in every part of my work. Um, the movie didn't really hang together, and not so surprisingly, I looked terrible in it. Yeah, Jerry's pretty worn out. You go personally bankrupt after all this success, and on the heels of his other two failures, to have this is like three in a row, like, dear Lord, maybe you should just hang it up. Uh, you know, not to criticize, you can just tell that that's written on his face. Uh, here's a fun thing, a fun note. Lewis's future wife uh, and the, the mother of his daughter, Sandy Pitnick, uh, has a cameo as a disco dancer. So keep your eyes peeled for a hip-looking Sandy. Uh, Lewis also played the part of Little Old Lady, dressed in drag. During the closing credits, that part was credited to Joseph Levitch, which is Lewis's real name. Or it, he claims for it to be his real name. Nobody has any real idea because they would just fudge things back in the day. Amazingly, even though critics hated this movie, it was not a bomb. It was a financial success in the sense that it did make money. It wasn't this blowaway hit, but it did very well in the sense that he could continue to make more movies. But critics hated it. And uh, I, 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 to illustrate to you how, uh, here's a review from Roger Ebert who gave it zero stars. One of the worst movies ever to achieve commercial release in this country. No wonder it was on the shelf for two years before it saw the light of day. Leonard Maltin gave it two stars out of four, commenting, not a very good movie. The opening montage is much funnier than anything that follows. When the movie was first shown in Miami, critics were not invited to the premiere, which is a horrible sign, as Fox would have afraid the word would get out about how bad the film was. Um, he was simply too old to keep doing this 
shtick. And, you know, in the 80s, that style of, of comedy didn't really work anymore. And he's not aware of that. He did not seem to, to grow. So at one point, you know, it is nostalgic in a sense, but it's wildly out of touch. And there's no better example than that uh, than when he becomes a hibachi chef. And all I'm going to say is it's, it's, it's wildly uh, uh, racist stereotypes and it's unpleasant and also unfunny. It's just, uh, you, it's no smart criticism of anything. It's just like blatant on the nose and, and just ugly. It makes uh, Mickey Rooney look woke. Uh, I will just say that. So the good is the king of comedy. The bad is hardly working, but we're about to get unknown and potentially a lot worse uh, with the 1972 unfinished-ish film, The Day the Clown Cried. Now, if you're familiar with this film, then you will, will know what I'm talking about. However, it's very likely that none of you have ever seen it because it's essentially unfinished uh, and unreleased. So Jerry makes Which Way to the Front. It's kind of a World War II-ish wacky slapstick, almost like a Mel Brooks comedy, but it doesn't land at all. Uh, so then he's, he's, um, he takes on this project. It's a drama film. It's a Swedish and French production. The French loved Jerry Lewis. Of course, he's starring in it and directing it. He didn't write it. It's based on an original screenplay by Joan O'Brien and Charles Denton. Uh, with additional material from Jerry Lewis. And if you watch it, you'll be able to see why. The film was met with controversy regarding its premise and content, which features, get ready for this, a circus clown who is imprisoned in a Nazi concentration camp. So uh, you can tell these. this is the, has all the makings of a disaster already. Why Jerry would decide to take on another World War II themed film after doing Which Way to the Front it was a bomb is beyond me. Why he would decide to play a clown again, I don't quite understand. This would essentially be his third time playing it, but then he would go to play another clown in Hardly Working. So it's like, what What are you doing? We get it, you make people laugh, but <clears throat> okay, let's, let's, let's read the premise. Keep in mind, this is a, an unfinished film. So this is pieced together from footage that was already released and the script, which is allegedly the actual script. No one is, is quite sure what the full deal is right now. And we'll find out why. Jerry Lewis plays a washed up German circus clown named Helmut Dork. We're off to a great start. During the beginning of World War II and the Holocaust, although he was once a famous performer who toured North America and Europe with the Ringling Brothers, that's a nice bit of uh, integrated branding, Dork is now past his prime and receives little respect. After Dork causes an accident during the show, the head clown convinces the circus owner to demote Dork. Upon returning home, Dork confides his problems to his wife, Ada, and she encourages him to stand up for himself. After going back to the circus, Helmet overhears the circus owner agreeing to fire him after the head clown issues an ultimatum. A distraught Helmet is arrested later by the Gestapo for ranting about Germany and drunkenly mocking Adolf Hitler. This is the second time in two films he's mocking Adolf Hitler uh, in a bar. Following an interrogation at the Gestapo headquarters, he is imprisoned in a Nazi camp for political prisoners. For the next three to four years, he remains there while uh, hoping for a trial and a chance to plead his case. He tries to remain... Uh, he tries to maintain his status among the other inmates by bragging about what a famous performer he once was. His only friend in prison is a good-hearted German named Johann. Camper sees a large group of Jewish prisoners, including several children. The other pr prisoners go dork into performing for them, but he does not realize he is actually not very good. The other prisoners beat him up and leave him in the courtyard to sulk about his predicament. So even though there are children in this camp. The focus is on how poor uh, the clown Jerry Lewis is being treated. He sees a group of Jewish children laughing at him from the other side of the camp. Um, delighted to be appreciated again, Helmet performs for them and gains an audience for a while until uh, the new prison commandments order that he stop. To make a long story, he ends up accidentally accompanying the children on a boxcar train to Auschwitz, and he's eventually used in Pied Piper fashion to help lead the Jewish children to their death in the gas chamber. This is is so bleak and depressing. 
even for a drama, and it's done in such a way where you would ask yourself, why would anyone do it? Like, what, what, what point is there to prove um, about doing it this way? Knowing the fear the children will feel, he begs to be allowed to spend the last few moments with them, leading them to the showers. He becomes increasingly dependent on a miracle, but there is none. He is so filled with remorse that he remains with them, taking a young girl's hand and, and walks with them into the chamber. So this is the thing. It's a drama film. Obviously, it's not pleasant. There's a lot of commentary there. The real issue and, and what makes this wildly inappropriate, in a sense is Jerry still plays his clown comedic moments as full bore 110% Jerry Lewis. So it is just wildly, wildly out of touch in every single way. He's incapable of toning it down here. And it's just quite frankly, inappropriate and uncomfortable and bizarre. And you can see why uh, this film is going to have the troubled journey that I'm going to tell you about right now. So in 1971, while performing at the Olympia Theater, Lewis met with producer Nat Washberger, who had offered him the chance to star and direct in this. Previously, uh, the role was offered to Bobby Darren, Milton Berle, and Dick Van Dyke. I could see Milton Berle having just as much trouble in this movie. However, someone like Bobby Darren or Dick Van Dyke perhaps could have hinged on hitting the, the genuine notes of a sad clown. I look at this film, I look at footage and I go, you know, if it was someone like Gene Wilder, who can very much be funny at times, but also charming and sweet and sympathetic and has a lot of pathos, as they say, uh, I could see it being a, a much more uh, uh, reasonable choice to make. They all declined. Uh, Lewis was initially reluctant to take the role, especially after reading the script. Uh, he said in his, his biography, the thought of playing Helmet still scared the hell out of me. In addition, he felt that he was wrong for the part due to the strong subject matter. So Jerry's aware of like, hey, you know, I do make wacky comedies and this is probably not something I'm, I'm able to handle. Uh, he also said, why don't you try to get Sir Lawrence Olivier? I mean, he doesn't find it too difficult to choke to death playing Hamlet. My bag is comedy, Mr. Washburger. And you're asking me if I'm prepared to deliver helpless kids into a gas chamber? Ho, ho, some laugh. How do I pull it off? Nevertheless, he rereads the first draft and he thinks that by taking this on, he would be doing something worthwhile in light of, you know, the Holocaust and World War II and speaking out against Nazis and hate and, you know, so that I can understand. He's compelled to, to, to take this on and really, he thinks he can do some good in the world with this, but he's also aware that it's a huge risk that may not pay off. He signed on to the project, uh, but in order to make it, he first had to perform at Caesars uh, in Vegas for a month in order to fulfill the terms of his contract with Caesars. So he's going to make it, but everyone has to hold on a month. So we get off to a slow start already. Uh, in February 1972, he toured the remains of Auschwitz and Dachau uh, concentration camps to shoot some exterior shots and uh, also in Paris, all the while reworking the script. Uh, he lost 35 pounds in six weeks by eating nothing but grapefruit, which is a very popular diet, though I do not recommend it. So he's running on straight acid when you're watching this movie. Principal photography was in Sweden. Uh, but there was numerous problems with the shoot. Film equipment was either lost or delivered late, and the necessary money was nowhere in sight. Lewis was repeatedly assured that money was forthcoming uh, by Washburger, who did not appear at all on set. Something tells me Washburger is is a really a little bit of a scam artist here. Jerry was convinced. I think he tugged at his heartstrings, and now he's being taken advantage of. Washburger not only ran out of money before completing the film, but his option to produce the film expired before filming began. So, you know, a lot of these contracts have a certain window of time that you need to do something in. If you don't do it, it, it elapses and it goes back to the original owners. He had paid the writer, O'Brien, the initial five grand, but failed to send her the, the additional 50 grand uh, due to her prior production. Uh, Lewis eventually ended up paying the production costs with $2 million of his own money to finish shooting the film. 
but the parties involved in its production were never able to come to terms that would allow the film to be released. So it gets held up on that front through no fault uh, of Jerry Lewis. Uh, so, you know, production-wise, this is a failure. And as you can see, content-wise, this is going to turn out to be a, a huge disaster. O'Brien was shown a rough cut of the film in an attempt to acquire the necessary rights to the release, but after viewing the product, decided that it was not fit for release and therefore did not agree with the producers or Lewis, uh, Lewis, uh, for it to, to be released. So a lot of people think Jerry Lewis held on to this film, but it's not. It was the, uh, the original writer said <laughs> this is not working, uh, at all. And you can see her elements in the film, uh, in terms of the story and the tone and all of that. But then Jerry interjects with all this classic Jerry Lewis comedy and it has zero place in this movie. Uh, after shooting Wrapped, uh, you know, I will commend Jerry Lewis put up his own money to get this thing finished. It was, a, you know, a noble, worthwhile thing to do and he took a risk uh, to get it made. After shooting Wrapped, Lewis announced to the press that Washburger had failed to make good on his financial ob obligations or even commit to producing, which is true. Washburger retaliated by threatening to sue Jerry for breach of contract. Uh, stating that he had enough to finish and release the film without Lewis, which sounds like total bullshit. Wanting to ensure the film would not be lost, Lewis took a rough cut of the film while the studio retained the entire film negative. So Jerry Lewis at this point says, you know what, to hell with this guy. I'm going to hold on to it just because I can to see if until all this gets settled. In 1973, Lewis stated publicly that the film was in final production. It had been invited to the Cannes Film Festival and would be released in America after that. The film was never officially released and remains unreleasable due to the failure to secure the underlying rights from O'Brien. So this negative is out there. Uh, Jerry has his own copy. Who knows who he's given it to, shown it to. Obviously, at that point, of a few people who had to have seen the film, uh, there was certainly, there's a lot of footage of behind the scenes, kind of trailerish stuff. Those things would come out during production to start promoting the film, uh, and the script has come out, but the full thing has not. Although, the rumor is a, a lot of people uh, in insider underground Hollywood have seen it. One such person uh, is Harry Shearer, you know him from the Christopher Guest films, and he voices Mr. Burns on The Simpsons. Um, in an article of Spy Magazine, uh, Harry Shearer said, with most of these kind of things, you find that the anticipation or the concept is better than the thing itself. But seeing this film was really awe-inspiring and that you are rarely in the presence of a perfect object, but this was a perfect object. This movie is so drastically wrong, its pathos and its comedy are so wildly misplaced that you could not, in your fantasy of what it might be like, improve on what it really is. Oh my God, that's all you can say. So, of course, with comments like that, the legend of this film only grew. Uh, Shearer, who did not know Lewis at all, gave his opinion on why Lewis would make the film. He thought... You know, Jerry must have looked at this film and said, well, this is, is really Oscar bait. And that's always a joke is that the Oscars, uh, people make Holocaust films or films about being gay or having AIDS or, or whatever, as they always feel like the Oscars will, will vote on those films. Um, in 2017, shortly after Lewis's death, uh, there was an article in Vanity Fair that brought to light a uh, previously unpublished interview with a French critic who have seen the film uh, in 2004. Uh, he does not know how he obtained a copy. Uh, he said, while the copy he watched is obviously a rough cut preliminary edit, it is generally followed the published script and did not seem to be missing any story elements, but this was his review of what he saw. I'm convinced it is a very good job. It is very, it is a very interesting and important film, very daring about both the issue, which of course is the Holocaust, but even beyond that as a story of a man who has dedicated his life to making people laugh and is questioning what it is to make people laugh. I think it is a very bitter film and a disturbing film. And this is why it was so brutally dismissed by those people who saw it or elements of it, including writers of the script. Uh, in 2013 interview with Jerry Lewis with Entertainment Weekly, uh, when asked about the speculation surrounding the film, 
Uh, Lewis said, I think it's like bad advertising. For it to become what it has become seems unfair. Unfair to the project, un unfair to my good intentions. Uh, the Data Clown Cried's infamacy has grown so large, he added, that it now has to either be better than Citizen Kane or the worst piece of shit that anyone ever loaded on the projector. I think there is also an element uh, of, of power Jerry has in holding this secret film that has so much controversial buzz about it. And I think that's also another reason why he liked holding onto it because as it as it got on and on and, and stories are spun and people have seen it, and I know people who have seen it. And uh, I, I do have a friend who has seen it. And I said, is it everything that you and, and my friend just said? Yeah. So, you know, you, your mind goes crazy with what it could possibly be. Having said that, I think there are a lot of elements there that, that could have worked from what I've seen, because in another sense, it echoes uh, a later work, which was very beloved, Life is Beautiful, with Roberto Benigni, where he's trying to entertain his son in the concentration camps. Tone matters. How you do stuff matters. And having sympathetic characters that you can understand matter. And, and Jerry Lewis is a wildly successful person and who was always a, dare I say, boisterous clown. And the fact that he can't turn it down, or tone it down, uh, makes you realize, gee, maybe this was a bad idea. However, there is some wonderful, wonderful light at the end of this tunnel. If you are very frustrated, if you haven't seen it, first of all, if you look online, there are a lot of clips, production stills and, and promo reels and things of that nature. Um, a German documentary film crew, I think, or maybe they're Swedish, tried to put, uh, piece it together and refilm stuff from the full script to see what the film looked like. They tried to do a behind the scenes kind of documentary just to figure out what the deal was. That's on YouTube, it's very interesting. However, even better than this, in 2015, the LA Times reported that Jerry Lewis had donated a copy of the film to the Library of Congress under the stipulation that it not be screened before June 2024, which I'm convinced he set that day because he knew by then he would be dead for sure. Uh, the Library of Congress intends to eventually screen it at their audiovisual conservation campus in Virginia. Rob Stone, curator of the Library of Congress, had stated that they will not be able to loan the film to other theaters or museums without permission from Lewis's estate. Stone has also stated they do not have any intent to release the film in any form on home media. Uh, and in a December 2018 article for the New York Times, Stone stated that the Library of Congress does not have a complete print of the film. So even though obviously there was a negative at some point, nobody knows who owns it. Nobody knows what happened to it. The footage that Jerry has is incomplete but perhaps it seems to be the most complete in the sense that he donated it saying, you know what? I, I, I think he liked, first of all, dying with that mystery and always having it there and making people wait because in 2024, when this comes out in June, 2024, we will be talking about Jerry Lewis again. I think it was a very calculated move uh, by Jer and uh, I am excited to finally see it in all of its horrible, horrible glory. So as much as we talk about it, until then, it will remain, in a sense, unknown. So this has been my TED Talk dissertation on Jerry Lewis and his fine work, the good of the king of comedy, the bad of hardly working, and the unknown, at least for the next four years, the day the clown cried. I am RJ City, and this is what I've chosen to do with my life. The even and Guests of the RJ City Show, subscribe to his channel, follow him on social media, and buy his t-shirts at ProWrestlingTees.com slash RJ City.